computer. Good morning. This is Joe Perprocki from Loyola Press, and very happy to be here with Catechus and the Diocese of Joliet, as we will be looking at the notion of the art of accompaniment and leading people from brokenness to fullness of life. And thank you so much for being here and please do use the chat feature to introduce yourself and to share what parish you're from and what grade level that you're teaching. And throughout the presentation, uh, to use the chat to add any of your comments or questions as we go along. And so we're jumping into our uh, topic right off the bat. I wanted to further introduce myself and let you know that uh, I have a blog that I invite you to visit. It's called Catechist Journey. Uh, and there's the uh, web address up above there, www.catechistjourney.com. And I've been blogging there for almost 15 years. In fact, in December, I'll be celebrating my 15th anniversary of blogging. And so there are literally thousands of posts uh, over that time and thousands of comments, actually over 10,000 comments from catechists just like you. And so if there's any topic at all that you want to look up and see what does it, uh, how can a catechist uh, find some help and support in that area, you'll find that on Catechist Journey, we've talked about just about everything over the years. I also have on the screen a QR code, that uh, black, uh, black and white box that you see. QR code is used very simply to hold up your, your camera in front of that uh, QR code in your camera mode, as if you're going to take a picture. And your camera, your iPhone, will scan that QR code and will take you to that location. So if you want to go ahead and try that now, you will have the uh, Catechist Journey right on your screen. Um, and I'm going to have a few other QR codes as well. And once again, this is being recorded. So if you couldn't get your feature, your camera up and running in time for that, when the recording is made available, you can go back and use it the same way. That QR code will be something you can put your camera in front of and scan. Um, and so I invite you to join me at uh, Catechist Journey. I'm also uh, letting you know that I am drawing a lot of this morning's presentation from uh, my most recent book, which is Preparing Hearts and Minds, Nine Simple Ways for Catechists to Cultivate a Living Faith. And these nine simple ways are what I will be sharing with you this morning, because these are ways that we accompany uh, those that we teach and how we lead them from brokenness to fullness of life. And so once again, there is a QR code for the book, Preparing Hearts and Minds. And if you scan that, you will have an instant link on your phone so that later on after this presentation is over and you want to explore that book a little deeper, you're welcome to go back and you'll have that uh, sitting on your phone waiting for you. Uh, so the, uh, the beauty of technology, right? Uh, it can be our best friend and our worst enemy. As long as everything's working, it's our best friend. And so far this morning, it seems like it is our best friend and not our worst enemy. Um, Okay, so I want to start off by talking about this notion of accompaniment. And I have a question for you, and it's kind of a rhetorical question because I'm pretty sure that I know your answer. And I should say that I, I hope I know how you would answer this as a catechist. Um, the question is, can robots serve as catechists? Would it be possible for uh, us as a church, or let's just say the Diocese of Joliet, someone gave the Diocese of Joliet a grant of $50 million to develop uh, catechist robots so that we wouldn't have to worry anymore about recruiting people like you and finding the time to train you and form you. And we'd have these wonderful robots who would have, you know, the entire uh, catechism in their programming would have all of church history, all church documents uh, in their programming, um, you know, would have everything that is, is needed to know uh, about being a catechist in their programming, and they would interact with children like you see in this picture. The kids could ask them any question uh, about the Catholic faith, and it would, would give answers. And boy, wouldn't that solve all of our problems? 
<laughs> I'm being facetious. I hope you know that. Um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go into the chat feature right now and explain your answer. Uh, I, I presume and I hope you're going to say no. <laughs> okay. But why not? I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Why couldn't robots be catechists? Why can't we just go ahead and take that $50 million and develop all these robots and put them in front of groups of children or adults like this and, and they could do the job and, and probably do it more efficiently than us because they'd have all the answers all the time. Uh, so I invite you to go into the chat and just type in a, a few thoughts right now about uh, why not? Why can't a, a robot be a catechist? And I'm going to open the chat and just start to see what people are saying. All right, so I'm scrolling up here. Um, absolutely not. We would lose human interaction. No, there's no human interaction involved. Um, what else are people saying here? Um, schooling through Zoom is the worst for kids. Okay, it's difficult, right? Robots can't can't make it relate to the kids in their lives. Machines cannot teach relationships. It would miss the human connection. They don't have a heart. That's what Peggy is sharing with everyone. I, I love that. They don't have a heart. And that's kind of poetic language, right? You know, because what we're saying is that the, the heart represents something more than the brain, which the brain represents, I think, a lot of times our, our thoughts and, and things like that, whereas the heart talks about feelings and relationships. But let's not forget the brain also has imagination, can dream of things that don't even uh, are not uh, present to the naked eye. And, and so a robot can't do that either. Uh, robots do not have feelings or empathy. Uh, we have to talk to the children and help them learn through play, through human interaction. Thank you, Michelle, for that. Uh, Jessica says, no, because robots don't show emotions. Um, it, it would be, uh, Jones says, it's good for our general answers, but we are human and not everything can be explained. I love that. You know, you think about it, can, can, uh, can science or can a robot explain why uh, something makes you cry? You know, why words on a page or a song that you listen to makes you cry? That, that's something that you have to explain with your feelings. There's no scientific explanation to that. Uh, they cannot connect with students as a human would. Robots cannot be personal. They, they would teach teach textbook and not life. Uh, they don't have a soul. Thank you. Recently, someone put that uh, put in the chat that it said that they, they don't have the Holy Spirit. Um, Kristen says Zoom was a challenge last year, to say the least. Human interaction is needed. Now, the, the thing is to write, notice that even on Zoom, there is human interaction. It's just I think you're talking about face to face interaction so you know teaching through zoom is is certainly not the equivalent of a robot teaching but it's it's you know certainly not something that was ideal right but definitely i know of uh, many experiences that i had where i was touched by the grace of another person on a zoom presentation i was brought to emotion i felt the presence of god uh, so that's something that can happen because some of you are still teaching, you know, uh, remotely, and I don't want you to feel like that's what I'm comparing this to, this idea of a robot as something different. Um, okay, uh, just looking at what else, the spirit would be lost without the soul, a robot has no experience of God, uh, see, so that there could be knowledge about God, but experience of God, that's something very different. Uh, missing the love connection and, and sh so on. Not just about head knowledge, but heart knowledge, relationship. Okay. Um, and eighth graders, Michelle says, eighth graders have those difficult questions and they would make it their mission to stump the robot. 
<laughs> You're right. You know, that's very true that they would be distracted and just turn it into a, a game that they would be playing. Well, thank you for all of those responses. This is exactly how I wanted us to start, because if we are talking about uh, the notion of uh, accompaniment, that's something that a, a robot cannot do. And that's why we place such value on people like you, the catechist. Um, a couple of thoughts of my own that I put on before I saw any of your comments. So unlike robots, a human catechist is capable of being divinized. And in other words, we are capable of sharing in the life of God. Uh, a robot is not capable of sharing in the life of God. A robot would be able to, uh, to speak to share knowledge about God and the life of God as told by other people. But the robot uh, itself could not talk about what it is to share in the life of the Holy Trinity, to share in the life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and so this notion of being divinized is, is so important for us. Uh, catechesis is so much more than simply the conveyance of information. Uh, it's an apprenticeship into a lifestyle. And so that's why um, it, we don't even replace catechists with a textbook. We don't replace catechists. I mean, think about it. We have wonderful textbooks, uh, and especially from Loyola Press. But you know, we could simply say, oh, well, the textbook has everything. Why don't we just give these textbooks to the to those we teach, have them read the textbook, give them a few worksheets, maybe a test or an assessment. And if they get everything right, we know that they're they're good Catholics. So we don't do that. And we would never do that with a, a robot either. We would never say, well, here's something to replace the catechist. We don't do that with videos, with DVDs. Um, bottom line is there's nothing that replaces the human being you, the catechist, who can apprentice young people into a lifestyle. So as helpful as all these resources are that we have today, and, and this Zoom is a resource. We're using this resource because we're, we're not quite ready yet to all join together in one place for a gathering like this. Um, but this doesn't replace the fact that we are human beings sharing with each other. We can still, even in a Zoom setting, we can share feelings, we can share stories, we can share our insights about mystery, um, hunches that we have about God, right? Isn't that a lot of what we have it turns out to be kind of a hunch? It's my hunch that God is like this because that's been my experience. Uh, so none of these resources can replace us. None of them can replace you. And none of them can truly accompany another human being. Only a human being can really accompany those on that spiritual journey. And so we begin with that notion this morning. You know, I want you to be very aware uh, of the, the fact that you are indispensable. And more than just showing kids how to use a textbook and more than just showing kids how to watch a video, uh, you are there to truly mentor them into a way of life. And I'm gonna be sharing with you some of the ways that uh, I, I hope you will are doing this and will do this so that we can help those we teach on this journey move from an experience of brokenness to an experience of fullness of life. And, uh, and so thank you for everything that you do. As we continue on, I invite you to use the chat if you want to put in a comment, a question. Uh, and again, I'm inviting uh, Joyce and uh, Leslie, keep an eye on the chat because once I get rolling, a lot of times I forget to, to go back <laughs> and check the chat and I don't want to miss anything there. And so if uh, you put in a question or a comment, uh, you'll hear one of them uh, unmute themselves and say, hey, Joe, got something here for you. And, um, uh, and then I will, can respond with that. Um, so I want to go back in time for some inspiration about, so how do we do this? 
how do we accompany people from an experience of brokenness to an experience of fullness of life? And we're going to go back to the early church and look at, well, how did the apostles do this? So after they experienced the loss of Jesus, remember when he died, they didn't know he was going to return through the resurrection. They did not know that. They had complete brokenness. Think of those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Um, they were leaving Jerusalem and running to Emmaus because they were devastated. Their dreams were shattered. Their hopes were shattered. They were experiencing complete brokenness of everything they thought was going to fulfill their life. And it wasn't until they encountered the risen Christ that those hopes were restored and their dreams were restored and they experienced once again fullness of life. And then they realized and they were called by the Holy Spirit to go forth and proclaim this good news that through the risen Christ, fullness of life can be experienced and brokenness can be healed, is healed through Jesus Christ. And so they went out after they encountered the risen Christ and after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they went out and they proclaimed the gospel. Now they did so in such a way, using a formula that we're going to unpack today. And the Greek word for this formula or strategy that they used is called the kerygma. Greek word means a kerygma, which basically means that they had a simple, basic, to the point, inspiring proclamation of Jesus designed to convert hearts and minds. Um, it, it's what I would refer to as a, a thumbnail proclamation. In other words, they were able to succinctly summarize the good news without having to go on and on and on and on and on. And on. Uh, another phrase I like to use is they had their elevator speech. You know, there were no elevators in that time, but today we use the phrase elevator speech. Uh, that if you think of it as you get on an elevator on the 10th floor, you bump into a friend and the friend says, oh, what are you up to? And I, you know, I say, hey, I'm writing a, a book. And they say, oh, what's it about? Well, as the elevator is going down from the 10th floor to the first floor, can I summarize it in one sentence? You know, so my book, Preparing Hearts and Minds, can I say, well, in this book, I share nine strategies for uh, catechists to uh, cultivate a living faith in those they teach. Bing, doors open. Okay, thanks, bye. Can we summarize the good news in a simple, basic, to the point, inspiring proclamation of Jesus? That's what the apostles did. And we need to be able to do this in our catechesis. Um, a good example of a, a charismatic phrase that a lot of people use, especially many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, is John uh, chapter 3, verse 14, right? John 3, 14. Do I have a 14 or is it 16? <laughs> I'm foggy this morning. <laughs> Joyce or, or Leslie can cor correct me on that. Um, anyway, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that those who believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Thank you, Joyce. So John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. That's a charismatic statement. And if someone were to say, well, what is the good news? You know, well, what's the heart of it? Why am I here? Or why am I wasting my time coming to weekly classes, CCD classes, whatever you want to call it? For God so loved the world and loves you that he sent his only son so that if you believe in him, you might not perish, but you will have eternal life. We need to be able to summarize that good news. And if we can do so, we have the charisma. 
And so that charisma needs to be at the heart of everything that we do, of everything that we teach. We need to be able to explain why we're here. Here's the good news. Uh, I've kind of de developed my own little uh, formula. If someone were to say, well, Joe, why on earth have you dedicated over 40 years of your life to uh, faith formation, to, to doing religious education? Uh, I would say because uh, the good, I want people to know the good news that God has drawn near to them and through his son, Jesus, uh, we are rescued, restored, and reaffirmed, reassured. Those are my three R's that I share. We're rescued, we're restored, and we're reassured. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. That's the charisma, folks. That's the good news that all of us are called to share with others. Now, um, where do we see this uh, being utilized in our contemporary society? This notion of sharing a simple, basic to the point, inspiring proclamation that's designed to convert hearts and minds. You notice when I read at that time, I left out the name of Jesus because there are many, many entities that are using this formula to proclaim something else, to convert hearts and minds, not necessarily about Jesus. And in fact, I'm going to show you an example of uh, examples we see all the time, and that is uh, through media. When we watch TV and we experience commercials, TV commercials, or go through magazines or on the internet, internet we come across ads. Uh, these ads know how to use a simple, basic, to the point. You know, they only have 60 seconds or 30 seconds to make their point. But their point is that they want to convert your heart and mind so that you will buy their product. So they are actually using the strategy very effectively. And so it's up to us to understand so how do we use this strategy? We're, our church is the one that came up with the strategy. <laughs> you know, so I'm not saying that we need to copy secular strategies. This is ours. This is what the apostles did from the get-go. And we've kind of lost it. You know, the, the, the world is, the secular world is using the strategy in many ways more effectively than ourselves. So how do we reclaim this? and say, no, we need to have simple, basic to the point, inspiring proclamations of Jesus Christ designed to convert hearts and minds. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you a TV commercial. I want you to watch this, and then I'm gonna unpack it and show you that there are basically nine strategies involved in this marketing process of trying to convert your heart and mind so that you will purchase something at the end of the commercial. Okay, let's sit back, get the popcorn out, watch this uh, little commercial about a product uh, that after you watch this, you may want to purchase. When you're not at a table, nothing is stable. Old-fashioned TV trays are okay, but you're always too far away. Hi, David Jones with The Table Mate, the transformable table that slides to you, making everything you do more comfortable. Wow, think? that's wonderful. This is excellent, wow. This is perfect, it really is. Whether you're eating, reading, or playing a game, TableMate's ingenious design lets you sit back and slide the table right up to your body. And with the built-in adjustable cup holder, no matter what position your TableMate's in, your cup will stay in. What do you think? That's very convenient. That's very convenient. The condensation isn't getting all over, making a mess. Cross-leg tables get stuck in the rug, but TableMate's L-shaped legs easily slide over any surface. TableMate easily adjusts to six different heights and three comfortable angles. It's like having 18 tables in one. It's strong enough to hold up to 50 pounds, and it still slides with just a finger. Amazing! TableMate easily transforms from a home workstation to a yummy snack server in a snap. And if your apartment doesn't have room for a desk, TableMate works best. The raised lip makes sure nothing slides or rolls off. And when it comes to game day or family movie night, a TableMate is just right. And when you're done, it folds flat for storage and it stacks for easy access. You could spend over $250 on all these tables and they still couldn't do what one TableMate can for just 
just $29.95. But wait, call or log on now and we'll send you a second table mate free. Just pay separate processing and handling. You get two table mates with the built-in adjustable cup holder, an incredible value, all for just $29.95. All right, there you go. That's the, the table mate, folks. I wonder how many of you are, are ready to, to go online and find that and buy it. I wonder if anyone has it. If anyone has purchased the table mate, go on the chat and tell us about it. When I'm in person, I'm usually able to, to ask people uh, about this, and I have had customers. <laughs> Michelle says, so cheesy, but now I want one. That's exactly the point that we're making, Michelle. I love what you're saying. It looks so cheesy, the commercial is so cheesy. But somehow through what they did, what that guy did in the 90 seconds, it's a little longer commercial. Uh, Rachel says, I've been meaning to buy one. Uh, Joyce says, my laptop is on one right now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Joyce is a table mate evangelist. Uh, we're gonna get to that in a second as well. Um, that's exactly the point that uh, that commercial had 60 or 90 seconds in this uh, example uh, to transform our hearts and minds. Uh, D Stevens D says, makes you feel like you have to have one and now to make your life so much better. Exactly. You have to have this. You got to have this. You know, that, are, are you getting the feel already for is that how we present our faith? Do we present it to others? So you got to have this. This is so good. You've got to have this. Or, or do we, are we simply sort of going through the motions that, well, today we have to do chapter three. So open up your books and let's, you know what I mean? You know, uh, a charismatic approach comes in every week we teach and says, I'm here to talk to you about Jesus. You got to have this. You've got to have this. Uh, Michelle says, now I need one for me and my daughter. Exactly. I'm glad that you're getting the, the point here. Um, and, and this is not to trivialize, because what we're going to do is we're going to unpack this now and show. And anyone who's into marketing knows that there are definite strategies that are, are followed. And, and this commercial that you just saw is uh, very formulaic. In other words, it follows steps that uh, were intentional. There's no accident that many of these commercials follow the same format. And so I'm going to point out to you what those nine um, strategies are. And then we're going to see how are these nine strategies, how can we use them more effectively in our faith formation, not in a manipulative way. That's a very important point that I want to make because commercials can manipulate we're not talking about using these strategies to manipulate people, but to, in, excuse me, to invite them to consider something that we truly believe, right? That, that's what this comes down to. We truly have got to believe that our relationship with Jesus Christ has transformed us and brought us fullness of life and has healed our brokenness. And why wouldn't we want to share that with other people? You've got to have this. Okay, so this is not manipulative as a way of, oh, I want to increase numbers. But I want to share the greatest gift that I, I've ever received. Uh, just saying that now makes me remember, and this, this is a good example of, of how the kerygma is used. The, the kerygma is what convinced my mom to become Catholic. My mom passed away several years ago at the age of 92. But she was a convert to Catholicism at the age of 13. She had a very difficult childhood, grew up in extreme poverty, uh, an abusive uh, parent, um, another parent who was distant because of mental health, reasons just a very very difficult life so she would spend most of her time hanging out with her friend Ramona and her friend Ramona happened to be Catholic and so on Saturdays Ramona would go to the church uh, to, on Saturday afternoon to go to confession my mom would go and sit and watch and then on Sunday she would go with Ramona and her family to to mass and sit and watch 
and she developed the sense that I want what Ramona has. Ramona seems to have something. And, and she asked Ramona's mom, who was my babysitter back when I was a kid, Mrs. Pye was her name, Mrs. Pachinsky, we called her Mrs. Pye for short. And so she asked Mrs. Pye, when you go up, when you go to mass and you go up to the priest to get something, what is it you go up there to get? Now here's the kerygma, Mrs. Pye responded. She said, oh, babe, that was my mom's nickname. Oh, babe, the greatest gift you could ever imagine. Isn't that a fantastic response? She didn't say, oh, you received the Eucharist, which is the transubstantiated wafer, meaning that the wafer, the bread, has uh, changed to become the body and blood. I mean, she could have uh, shared doctrine, right? What she shared was the kerygma. She shared a message that made my mom go, really? I, I have to have that because her answer simply was, oh, babe, the greatest gift you could ever imagine. You gotta have it. That, that's the approach that we need to take as catechists, that what we are presenting is the greatest gift you could ever imagine. And you've got to have this. So what are the nine points that we see? The first thing that they do in a marketing strategy is they point out that something's broken and something needs fixing so what did you see in that commercial they showed uh people using old-fashioned tray tables and they're horrible they were falling over they were spilling things there's food th being thrown all over the place stains on the carpet people looking frustrated oh my goodness if you have an old tray table your life is a mess but we have an alternative. You know, did you think about how many commercials start off or ads start off with, are you tired of, right? Are you tired of feeling bloated? Are you tired of back pain? Are you tired of, you know, I can go on and on. Are you tired of? The first thing they want to point out is that something's broken and, and you are experiencing that. You need some fixing in your life. But what they're saying is that this product will change everything. You know, everyone using the table mate looks so happy, <laughs> right? The people using old trade tables were annoyed and unhappy, but the table made people happy. It's an alternative. Uh, so this is the first thing they do is they point this out. Uh, another thing they do is they typically point out, uh, who's this coming from? Uh, often it's the name of a company that you would recognize and, and it would be like, oh, this is from a trusted source, or they use a spokesperson that you trust. Hi, I'm so-and-so, you know, and you're like, oh, I like that person. And you watch and that person is telling you something. You're like, well, if he or she did this commercial, then he or she must really believe in this. And I trust this person. So I'm gonna trust this product, all right? Here's the biggest one, is that they spend the biggest chunk of time telling you about the amazing things that this product can do. So that fellow in the commercial went on and on and on about all of the amazing things that the table mate can do. And uh, by the end of it, you're like, wow, <laughs> right? That's, that's why we say, I think I got to have that because it can do so many amazing things. Um, the fourth thing that they do is they, they often, in this commercial did it, they often include one amazing thing that is so amazing, it defies logic. It defies belief. So you saw him take that huge container of water, right? And put it on that tray table, on the table mate, I should say, and then pull it with one finger. Uh, most of us watch that and go, get out of here. That little flimsy thing is going to hold that huge gallon or not gallon, but container of water. Get out of here. I got to see that for myself, right? Sounds like Thomas, the apostle. I got to see this for myself. That's too amazing. 
Jesus, he's crucified, he's back, he's risen. I got to see this for myself. That's too good to be true. That defies belief, that defies logic. But we want to see, right? All right, one of my favorite parts of their strategy. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I think that's the part we tend to laugh at in these commercials. And the guy in this commercial, he used those exact words. You know, about two thirds of the way through, you think the commercial's over and he says, but wait, there's more, you know, act now and get two for the price of one or, or something. They, they kind of go on with piling it on just when you think that you, you've seen it all. But wait, there's more. Uh, the sixth strategy, they offer an invitation. So it's one thing to just show what the table made is but it's important that they invite you to get one. And so they share a phone number and they share a, a web address and they say, you know, don't wait, join the table mate nation, join all the happy customers, don't be left out. Come on, come join us. Very clear invitation. These ads typically provoke some kind of emotion. Now that wasn't overly abundant in this commercial, but they did show frustration, right? Of the people who were using the old tray tables were frustrated. And the people using the table mate, happy, <laughs> right? Provoking emotions so that when you see the frustration, you often would look at it and respond and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's my life. Trade the trade tables. I'm always knocking that over. I'm always spilling. Or the kids, when they use them, they're always spilling things, you know. Bleh. Provoke emotion. You're going to, commercial is going to be more effective if emotions are provoked. The, the eighth strategy, they invite you to commit to a program, not just to a resource or a, a product, that they basically are saying that this table mate or whatever it is you're buying will touch every aspect of your life. You'll use it all the time, right? So you're not just going to get it and use it to put a dish on. You know, you're going to get it to watch sports. You're going to get it for your children to do homework. You're going to get it to watch TV. You're going to get it for on and on and on and on commit to this new lifestyle change. Okay, and finally, number nine, they want you to go out and tell other people. And so what did they do? Even in that commercial, they showed interviews with people who are sitting in front of the table mate saying, oh, this is wonderful. There's no condensation on it. There's no this, it's not falling over. This is great. Customer evangelists. I'm not making up that phrase, folks. The business world uses the phrase customer evangelist. Uh, evangelizing is, is a religious term that, that the church has used for 2,000 years. The business world has usurped that language. I'm going to show you towards the end of this presentation, there's actually a book in the business section of Amazon or any bookstore you go to that is called How to Create Customer Evangelists. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It's about how to sell, how to sell things. So are they evangelizing? Yeah. They're evangelizing. They're spreading the good news about their products. You know, so, so that's why, again, I'm saying not that we're going to copy their techniques and imitate their slick approach, but they're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we have to reclaim that and do it better for something that we truly believe in. And that is the life of Jesus Christ. All right. So. We're about halfway through our presentation, and I want to pause here to invite you to share any thoughts, insights, or questions in the chat that you have about what I've shared so far. I'm going to leave these nine strategies up here for a second and just see if any of you have any questions or comments or insights that you would like to share. I'm going to go back to the chat. 
and open it up because I know a few of you uh, were, were saying things about that table mate and so on. But let's see if uh, anyone else, uh, someone says I've been meaning to buy one. I may have read that one before. Okay. Um, but yeah, any thoughts about what I've shared for, so far about these uh, nine strategies that you see on TV uh, in commercials and ads and, and about uh, how we need to be using those strategies. I'm gonna pause and drink a little water here. Um, Leslie says, makes sense on how to evangelize our students and adults we come into contact with. Uh, thank you, Leslie, and I hope that as I share, uh, it's gonna make even more sense because I'm gonna share examples. So how do we do this as, as catechists? Um, you know, I think I've already shared, you know, the one point, you know, telling that story about my mom and how someone converted her simply by, by saying that the Eucharist was the greatest gift you could ever dream of. Uh, Joyce says, we have to know how the good news works in our lives first so that we can become evangelists. Thank you, Joyce. I'm going to share on that in, in a few moments. We've got to be able to tell our stories. Mrs. Pye did that, you know, she didn't just say, well, you know, babe, you need to become Catholic and, and study your, you know, catechism, and then you'll understand and you could join us. You know, she was recruiting my mom right then and there uh, by saying, oh, babe, the greatest gift you can ever imagine, you shouldn't be without it. And my mom uh, eventually came to that decision. And then as a 13 year old girl with no parental support, went to the rectory, rang the doorbell and asked if she could become Catholic. Why? Because she wanted the greatest gift that Mrs. Pye had ever spoken of. Isn't that something? Um, Let's see, a couple of others. Michelle says, but wait, there's more. Uh, we make so much fun of that, but when we talk about Jesus, there is so much more to share, deeply more, and we have to figure out how to share that with kids. Look at how that, that more saved me, like testimony. You're right on target, Michelle. I'm actually gonna be you know, using that phrase about testimony in just a few moments. Uh, Sarah says, what you are offering needs to meet the needs of those you are trying to reach. Absolutely, you know, we, we have to, to connect with their brokenness, uh, their, their emptiness, their part of their life that needs to be fulfilled. Uh, and, and that's how we're going to make a connection. If it doesn't connect, you know, kids are always asking, why do I need to know this? You know, teachers know that every subject you're teaching, algebra, history, any math, uh, you know, uh, social studies and so on, science, why do I have to know this? You know, they want to know how does this connect with my life? Um, uh, Michelle also says for number five, but wait, there's more. Uh, when our session's on, perhaps a little teaser about what we're going to learn next month. I love that. You know, say, hey, and next month or next week, whatever it is, when you come back, I'm going to be sharing with you how X, Y, Z, fill it in. You know, the, don't you notice how that it, even like when we watch the news, they tell, they use teasers all the time. They're trying to get us to stay for after the commercial. Uh, after this break, we'll go to the weather. Is there a storm on the way? Brand Miller will tell us in just a few moments, you know, or after this commercial, the sports, the uh, Blackhawks had a big game last night. Were they victorious? I'll let you know in 60 seconds. You know, they do that all the time. Uh, Teresa says, uh, I've noticed young teens are really into TikTok. Uh, she says, I work at a school, so I know most of the videos are really simple, yet it attracts them. You're absolutely right, Teresa. Simplicity. Are we able to make our message simple? Uh, Leslie, Leslie says, uh, meet people where they are at and don't judge. Yeah, so when we meet them, we don't point a finger and say, you're broken. You need to be fixed. What we need to do is we need to help people come to the realization that don't we all experience brokenness? And I think we do that often by sharing our own brokenness, right? Not just not pointing fingers at how you are broken, but 
how how am I broken and how has Jesus uh, healed that? Uh, Jessica says, I think that's true. We need to catch the student's attention to make an impact uh, in their life. Okay, wonderful comments. Thank you. Continue to put them in, even as I'm talking. That's not rude. Uh, and again, if there's something there that I've missed, I'll come back to it later. Or if it's something that, that looks like uh, it needs to be dealt with right now, um, uh, Joyce or Leslie will interrupt me and say, Joe, here's a comment I think you or a question you should deal with right now. But let's start looking now at how we do this in our faith formation. Okay. Uh, so we have about another uh, 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes for us to, to go together. So thank you so far for hanging in there. Great interaction, great thoughts. Keep using that chat to, to share. So in the kerygma, um, the first thing that we do, the first thing the apostles did was they pointed out how the current reality that we live in is broken. You know, it doesn't take much for us to make this point. You know, turn on the news. By five minutes into the news, we're all thoroughly depressed by how broken our world is. You know, shootings happening, killings happening, carjackings, corruption, and political strife, racial strife. Oh my goodness, <laughs> turn off the news. Um, the world is broken, but even on a personal level, you know, how many of us are just carrying around brokenness in, in our own hearts or in the pit of our stomachs and broken relationships, loss of a loved one, whether through sickness or death or a broken relationship, loss of a job, loss of income, chronic pain, you know, on and on. We are all carrying around uh, brokenness, despair. We, we have despair. We have depression. We have so many things that, that we're carrying. It doesn't take much to, to help us all realize that, yeah, I, I, I've got some brokenness. Or, and, and if that's too dramatic, perhaps the word emptiness. There, all of us have just some part of us that we're still looking to fill up. Even if we would say, no, my life is pretty well put together. Yeah, everything's pretty good. You know, that's good. But, but boy, I wish this or I wish that. You know, there's some part of me that's still yearning. That's what we do in the kerygma. And then we proclaim an, an alternative way of living. It's called the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God referring to a world in which God reigns. R-E-I-G-N-S. God reigns. God is the one we turn to to fulfill that emptiness to heal the brokenness. The greatest gift you could ever imagine. That's the, the kingdom of God. God reigns. Um, the second strategy that we identify Jesus Christ as the trusted source of this. Where is this coming from? Who is it coming from? It's not coming from me. I'm not making this up. Mrs. Pye didn't say it's hers. She said the greatest gift you could ever imagine that God gives us. It's Jesus Christ. And, and showing that we trust him and telling the stories of how we trust him. I'm going to break that open in a, in a second. Uh, do we tell Jesus' mighty deeds? Do we talk about you know, what Jesus has done and is doing? And I think that's an important part we're going to get to. It's great to tell the stories of what Jesus did in, in the Gospels. He healed the blind, restored their sight. He healed the lame. He healed lepers. He restored people to life. To tell about what Jesus did in the lives of the saints, too. You know, Jesus did this for Saint so and so, and this for Saint so and so. And what did he do in their lives? But then also, how about our own lives? And what has Jesus done in our lives? And, and we need to show that those are mighty deeds. Okay, I'm going to break those open in a second. So and I'm teasing you now, right? You know, hang in there, stay with me, and we're going to revisit all nine of these, and I'm going to give you some strategies for how to do that. Um, we said that one of the amazing deeds defies logic. It's beyond belief. Well, Jesus uh, gave us the key to eternal life by dying on the cross. 
you know, it defies logic. How, how do you gain life by dying? What that defies logic. And yet you're saying that that's the key to eternal life. We're like, yeah, <laughs> laying down your life is the key to eternal life. Okay. I got to see this for myself. Right. Um, but wait, there's more. It doesn't end with the cross. Jesus rises from the dead. That's why we put crosses up in our homes because it's a symbol of victory. It's not a symbol of, of the end. It's a symbol of transition, but a symbol of victory that Jesus uh, crushed death by dying and rising. So, but wait, there's more. All right, number six, we offer invitations. We invite others to follow Christ more closely. We make specific invitations. And those are often little baby steps like, oh, well, what's next for you? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? That's what spiritual directors do, right? They're like, you know, why don't you try doing this? And so we should think of ourselves and the, to those we teach, we should think of ourselves as their spiritual directors. And, and you know, sometimes we do take uh, our uh, individuals we teach on the side, so to speak, and we speak to them individually. Have you ever thought about trying this? You should think about being a lector at, at mass. I had a professor back in college who took me aside and said, did you ever think of public speaking? You have a, you have a voice made for public speaking. You should think about that. Um, wow, here I am 40 years later still public speaking because one of my teachers in, in college, but he was still my religion teacher, took me aside and gave me an invitation. You know, did you think about this? I invite you to think about doing some public speaking. You know, we make an impact when we uh, take people aside and we said, you should think about this. You should think about that. <clears throat> Excuse me, we should aim for the heart. We said that in commercials, they provoke emotion. Um, are we only aiming for the head, head knowledge? Or are we also touching hearts, touching where emotions live? Number eight, are we helping those that we teach to not just sprinkle a little Jesus into their life, but to uh, adapt a whole new lifestyle? To, to make a commitment to a new lifestyle, to a lifestyle change, a rearranging of their entire life. And then finally, are we helping them to become customer evangelists? Are we helping them to go out and tell others about the greatest gift that they have received and why you've got to have this? Um, that's our goal is to get them so on fire that they want to go out and, and in whatever way they choose to do so to tell others you've got to have this. Many people do that today simply by uh, sharing on social media um, where they've been and what they're doing. Um, I know a lot of people who will, will, will say, um, what an experience this morning at, at Mass. You know, I went to St. Such and Such Parish and Father told such a wonderful homily, um, touched my heart. That's it. They just put that out there. That's what their way of saying, there's something in my life that is, has brought about change and it's fulfilling me. <clears throat> and I invite you to think about that. Uh, that's how we become evangelists ourselves. All right, let me check the chat here because I know uh, a few people uh, put in a few comments while I was talking. And I want to share a few of those, and then I'm going to go continue on and talk about uh, some specific strategies. Excuse me. Okay. So I think so. Jessica said, I think it's true. We need to catch the students' attention, make impact on their life. I may have read that. Yeah, okay. Let's see a few others. The commercial had enthusiasm. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, that's in our teaching. Right? Exactly. You know, I, I hope I do that in my presentations. I mean, 
before I start, you know, I, I try to make sure I'm awake and ready <laughs> and, and have energy, you know, and that I, I hopefully show that even though I've done this presentation dozens of times that it sounds like it's the first time I'm doing it. And I, I'm not kidding you there. I have done this exact presentation literally dozens of times. So every time I do it, I need to, to remind myself, make it sound like this is the first time you're ever doing this. Um, Michelle says eighth grade, uh, we talk about bullying and how kids can rise above that and how they can make right uh, inclusive decisions. We have to keep it to their level. Our brokenness might be, uh, might be too big for them to relate to. So bringing it to bullying is relatable, but I need other um, broken eighth grade ideas. Yeah, you're exactly right, Michelle. I mean, <clears throat> sometimes our brokenness might be too big and it might be inappropriate to share some of our own brokenness. It's not, it's full self-disclosure is not what we're required to do as catechists. In fact, when I talk about sharing our brokenness, I like to encourage catechists to share the brokenness you had when you were an eighth grader, you know? So what was it like when you were in eighth grade? What was some of the experience? Were you lonely? Were you left out? Were you bullied? Uh, did you experience or what did you experience at that point? You know, bring it to their level uh, so that they can relate to it and they're not gonna be overwhelmed by, oh my goodness, you know, I, I have known teachers and, and um, uh, religious figures who overwhelm their audience with their own brokenness. I knew a priest who did that. He was a wonderful priest, but he would overwhelm us with his brokenness such to the point it was like, oh my goodness, I don't know if I want to hear anymore. Too much information. You know, it was almost inappropriate self-disclosure, like too much. That, that's something you should be telling your spiritual director, your, a confidant, a therapist, and I'm not being facetious about that, you know? So, so yes, what, what we do reveal about our brokenness needs to be uh, appropriate. Um, so Teresa in responding to Michelle says, hey, I've, I've got one uh, in terms of examples, maybe about starting a trend of being a good example and being a good neighbor. Some, but not all TikTok videos promote bad examples uh, for reactions or attention, a different kind of challenge. So yeah, just the example of, you know, experiencing negativity on social media. Um, so uh, Joyce says the farmer's insurance commercial on TV right now tells the story of restoration after a house is destroyed. <laughs> Spoils the happy ending. She put the link in there. Good. Take a look at that when you get a chance. All right. We know that Jesus has already won victory for us. Uh, Teresa says, I always make sure I have plenty of enthusiasm. I'm always excited whenever I teach my students. It's so fulfilling. That's such an important thing, folks. Uh, I remember years ago when um, uh, I was asked by a parish to come in and just observe some of their catechists. <clears throat> and I went into a class and I observed the catechist who had been teaching for 20 years. She knew her stuff. Um, she, she really wanted to help, but she was so tired <clears throat> of being a catechist and just tired of life. She had a very difficult job and it showed every bone in her body and every look on her face looked like she did not want to be there. You know, and, and I felt for her. Um, she was defeating herself. We shoot ourselves in the foot if we come on and, and we say, well, today I'm going to tell you about the greatest gift you can ever imagine. <laughs> That's not going to work. You know, one of the things about Mrs. Pie that I remember is my babysitter. She had such enthusiasm. She had a zest for life and she had this smile. Her whole face would just wrinkle up. So I could, I could picture her telling my mom as a, when she was 13, oh, babe, the greatest gift you could ever imagine. <laughs> I can picture the enthusiasm coming through. All right. We have 25 minutes to, uh, to share. I say one more chat just popped up. <clears throat> um, 
Teresa goes on to say, St. Teresa of Avila said, Lord, save us from gloomy saints. Thank you. <laughs> yes, save us from gloomy saints, save us from gloomy catechists, save us from gloomy speakers and public speakers and presenters, right? Uh, and God save uh, those that we teach from uh, a gloomy us, right? We can't do that. All right, let's move on now. I'm going to go back to, through these nine and share with you some specific ways that we do this. So I'm kind of going to review these nine, but slow it down a little bit. Number one, <clears throat> we point out that reality is, that is broken and that there's an alternative. Commercials do that by, by saying, are you tired of, you know, so if you have the flu, are you tired of fe feeling miserable when you have the flu? Well, now there's Tamiflu. That's what that little ad is for. Um, do we do this? We need to do this. A, a more evangelizing catechesis must proclaim a new narrative, not one of loss, not a narrative of brokenness, not a narrative of despair, which is what the narrative many young people are carrying around. <clears throat> and that's why uh, our thread of chat was talking about, we need examples from eighth grade life, sixth grade life, third grade life, adult life, whatever, whoever you're teaching, you need to get in touch with what are they experiencing in their life that might be causing them loss, brokenness, or despair. And then remind them every time you teach that you are bringing them a message of rescue, restoration, and reassurance. You know, we're going to hear a message that heals us, that repairs us, that fixes us. You know, isn't that something we would all want? It's not you. We're not going to teach something just because you need to know this to be a good Catholic. We've got to get past that and be able to say, you need to know this because it's going to save you. <laughs> it's going to heal you. It's going to change your life. And we need to believe that as well. I mean, I truly believe that what Jesus offers us changes our lives. Changed my life. Changed your life. And I, let's talk about that a little bit more um, in, a, in a moment. Actually, this is where I'm going to start talking about it. We need to talk about what Jesus has done. Um, just looking, I'm going to actually come back to that in a second, okay? Telling our stories. But let's focus on this notion then of, of if we're going to be sharing this greatest gift, we have got to say the name. This gift is Jesus. Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we Catholics are a little, we hide behind some sterile language sometimes. We talk about having faith and what the church teaches us and the catechism says this. It's like, why don't we talk about Jesus? Why don't we, why don't we just say the name? Jesus can be trusted. You know, there are lots of sources in life that cannot be trusted. And we want to say, Jesus is the son of God. He can be trusted. That's why the, the fathers of the church went to such great lengths to formulate the creed that we, we pray because there were different opinions going around about Jesus and who exactly he was. Oh, he was just a man who looked like God or acted like God, or he was, he was God who acted like a man, but he wasn't really a man. He was just sort of putting on an act. Those are called heresies. And our church formulated the creed and says, no, no, this Jesus can be trusted because he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. You know, look at the words that they chose. They wanted us to know that this Jesus can be trusted because he's not just any guy who came along and said, hey, look at me. He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Um, we've got to be able to talk about this. 
Um, Joyce puts in a question. Good question. When you prepare a lesson, what does this have to do with Jesus? Thank you. <laughs> what does this lesson have to do with Jesus? And how and, and what is Jesus offering me that is life transforming? I think that's the second part of the question. How is what I'm teaching life transforming? Whether that be in small ways or, or significantly huge ways. Um, so do we teach Jesus as a trusted source? Uh, you and I have a very important job of building trust. Um, we need to create a climate of trust. So the first thing is, do the young people trust us? Do they see us as authentic? Or do they see us as manipulative? You know, we have to be careful about that. Um, I, I once uh, encountered a speaker who... Um, seem to be able to produce tears at will that it started to look manipulative that he was he was manipulating his audiences into oh look at me i'm so moved by this you know I and mean, we can exaggerate that with you know some of the examples we see on tv you know of evangelists on tv oh they show such emotion you know is it real is it authentic you know, it, this can be hard for those of us who are introverts, and I, I'm an introvert, so technically I have good extrovert skills, but technically I'm an introvert, so it's not always easy for me to express outwardly what I'm feeling inwardly. I, I have to, I've trained myself to be better at that. Uh, I tell people that, you know, at a moment like this, I'm showing about as much joy as I can authentically show. <laughs> That's the, I'm, I'm absolutely gushing at this moment. There's really not much more I could do and look authentic because it's just not me. Some people gush. I'm not a gusher, <laughs> you know? So I, I have to find ways of sharing it in a way that does not look phony, in a way that does not come across as uh, manipulative. We all have to do that. We all have to look at what looks right for me. You know, in terms of sharing this joy so that people trust me, so that, that people uh, say, okay, he or she is authentic. I know I'm not being taken. All right, here's where we get to talking about their giving testimony. So in commercials, they proclaim the mighty deeds that these products can do. You know, I just found four pictures of products that the person in the picture or someone speaking about it is telling them the amazing things that these products can do. Well, remember when John the Baptist was in prison and, and he had an inkling, he was pretty sure Jesus was the one, but he was, John was about to lose his head, right? <laughs> he wanted to know for sure that he was doing it for the right reason. So he sent some of his disciples to Jesus to ask, are, are you the one? John wants to know for sure, are you the one? What did Jesus respond with? He said, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. Go back and tell him about the mighty deeds. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Go back and tell him what you have seen. So this is what we do in our faith formation. We tell what we have seen. We tell what we have heard. And so we tell the stories from the gospels of what Jesus has done, his mighty deeds. We tell the stories of the good news that he has proclaimed. We tell the stories of uh, what he has done in the lives of the saints. So, so we need to tell three kinds of stories, Bible stories, saint stories, and then folks, 
And this is where I want to spend a little time is our own stories. We give testimony. Someone put that in the thread before. That's why I chose this picture. Someone is called to the witness stand. You're called to share what you have seen, what you have heard. Uh, we need to share stories. Now, a lot of times when I tell this, the catechists are like, well, what do you mean my story? I don't, I don't have a story. I was baptized when I was a baby and went, got first communion at age seven, confirmation in eighth grade. I'm Catholic. I go to mass. You know, what do you mean my story? It takes a little reflection to think about it. But I tell catechists, the first story that you can tell and that you should tell is, why are you a catechist? How did that happen? How, how did you become a catechist? Your life changed because of Jesus. There's no reason to be a catechist unless uh, uh, because of Jesus. He's the one who made this happen somehow in some way, shape, or form, your life has changed. You no longer have an evening once a week to yourself or a Saturday morning to yourself because now you give that time to Jesus. Your life has changed. So that's the first story. Once you start telling stories like that, you're going to realize that you do have stories. Some of them may be profound. You know, some people do have changes in their lives, like St. Paul you know, on the road to Damascus that are quite dramatic. But many of our stories are not overly dramatic, but they're, they're quietly dramatic. You know, becoming a catechist, I've heard some really dramatic stories. I was talking to someone recently who shared that they've been a, a catechist and now a catechetical leader for over 40 years. And it started with the uh, person who recruited them was the catechetical leader calling out to them after mass one time saying, hey, you. That's how they were called. The person didn't even know their name, but said, hey, you. And then called them over and started talking to them about becoming a catechist. And that's how their life was changed. And here they are 40 years later because someone called out and said, hey, you, I want to talk to you. Now, I'm not recommending that as the best way to recruit people to be a catechist, at least get to know their name before you say, hey, you. But that's their story. That's kind of a dramatic story. So we need to be able to tell those stories. Um, Sarah says, good reminder that parents are the first and true catechist. We, the directors and catechists, can support and empower families to share their own faith stories with their children. Parents need to be reminded that we are here to support them in their family's faith journey. Thank you, Sarah. Powerful point. You know, do we, are we helping parents tell their stories? Um, when we have parent meetings, do we invite parents to share their stories or is it just us talking to them? You know, I, I think at parent meetings of any kind, we should have a panel of parents there who are going to share their stories as an example to others. First communion of parents meeting, why not have a panel of four or five parents who are going to share uh, their stories of uh, bringing their child to first Eucharist? Um, parents need to know uh, that they have stories and they're telling their stories to each other and to, uh, to their own children. You know, the, that story about Mrs. Pye, I only know that because my mom told me that story. All right, so parents need to tell stories. Uh, Michelle says, I always tell kids to talk to their parents, ask them questions. Yeah, have the kids uh, draw the stories out from their parents. All right, I'm going to keep going. I know, keep chatting and there. I'll do come back at the end. We have 10 minutes left uh, and I, I want to make sure that uh, we cover all of these. So we said number four, boast of the cross. So in commercials, they often um, boast of something that is uh, defies logic, defies belief. Here, here's an ad you see on your screen for a diet that talks about eating more. Are you eating enough to lose weight? What? You mean I can eat more to lose weight? I'm interested in that. <laughs> I don't want to eat less. I want to eat, I want to eat more. Well, 
people come to us and, and we're saying, are you interested in eternal life? And they say, yeah, what, what do I need to do? And we show them a cross. Here's what you need in your life. You need to learn how to lay down your life. And it's like, you know, you're showing me a picture of a dead man. And you're telling me this is the key to eternal life. We're like, yes, this is the key to eternal life. Laying down your life for others. And we need to help people understand what that phrase means. Laying down your life does not necessarily mean physically dying. That's the ultimate example of someone laying down their life. But we did lay down our lives anytime we set our own needs aside and put the needs of others first. We need in our faith formation to teach young people how to lay down their lives. So this is a picture of me and you see my wife, uh, Joanne, off to the left in that picture with some sixth graders uh, that we took uh, when I was a catechist, took them to a Ronald McDonald house so they could lay down their lives for two hours, set their own needs aside and take care of the needs of the guests at the Ronald McDonald house. At the end of the year, every child in that class said that their favorite experience of religious education was going to the Ronald McDonald House. It touched their hearts. It gave them an opportunity to learn that, yeah, we laid down our lives for two hours and look at the smiles on their faces. They came away with new life. By laying down our lives, we, are, we gain new life. And so we have to make this part of our faith formation is apprenticing young people in laying down their lives. But wait, there's more. It doesn't end with laying down our life. There is resurrection. There is new life, which is why we are joyful people. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, some of you know, Todd Williamson, he's the director of liturgy here in Chicago. He says that even on Good Friday, we know that Jesus is risen. Is that there's no reason to go to Good Friday service pretending like you're going to awake. Is it yes, it's a, a somber, sober, I should say, a sobering um, liturgy. But we don't act as though Jesus is dead and now we're waiting for him to rise. He said, even on Good Friday, we have joy. It's more sober, but we have joy. We know that Christ is risen. And so in our faith formation, we bring that joy into our setting. Jesus Christ is risen, and he is present. He is here with us. And, and therefore, we must engage with him, not just talk about him, but as catechists, do we take time to stop talking and invite those we teach to talk to Jesus? Do we lead them in a guided reflection so that they can spend time with the risen Christ? I had a catechist tell me recently that while he was a little down about doing his lessons remotely and feeling like perhaps they weren't effective, he said he'd led a guided reflection of seventh graders in a remote setting and afterwards asked them to react, say anything. And one of the young men said, hey, this is the first time that God was ever in my room. Wow, I mean, that's pretty, pretty powerful. It was the first time that there was any God talk in this young man's room at home because the catechist was helping him recognize that Christ is alive, he's present, he's risen. And yes, he is in cyberspace. That through that Zoom presentation, that young man recognized God in his room. That's pretty powerful. Now, number six, are we inviting people to take next steps? You know, commercials are inviting people to, the next step is to pick up the phone. The next step is to go online. The next step is to click here. You know, in marketing, they call it a call to action. What's the call to action? If you're a marketer, if you forgot to put a call to action in your ad, you've slipped up. You know, so if you're looking at an internet ad, where's the call to action? It should be a click here. 
For more information, click here. To buy, click here. Well, do we do we have a click here for those we're teaching? You know, for the next step, click here. Here's what you need to do next. Um, in my life, one of the people who had a click here button was uh, one of my high school teachers, Father Terry Baum, uh, my chemistry teacher. He was also in charge of the liturgies at high school at St. Ignatius, where I was a student. And he knew that me and some of my buddies were playing guitar because we were going to be rock stars, of course. And uh, he wanted some music at the liturgies. So he said, hey, Joe, uh, maybe you and some of your buddies can uh, play guitar at the mass. He said, I'll do all the singing. I'll give you the music. I just need some accompaniment. I was like, hey, cool. I like Father Terry. He's a cool guy. I had no interest in liturgy. But he invited me to take a step. And that step was life changing. It, it immersed, immersed me in the life of liturgy in a way I hadn't been immersed before. Uh, here's a picture of us 40 years later at um, my high school 40th reunion. Father Terry, me, and my friend Mike uh, sort of recreating that moment. All because he invited me. Do we do that as catechists? Are we inviting young people to, hey, would you do this? Are you thinking of this? Would you think of this? Next steps for them. Call to action. Click here. Okay. Are we touching the heart? You know, I think of those uh, commercials that Sarah McLaughlin does for uh, 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 pet, uh, animals that are neglected. Oh my goodness, the music and the way she talks and the, the sad animals she shows. I, I'm crying by the end of any commercial that she puts on. <laughs> and how many people probably pick up the phone or go online and make a donation because she touches the heart? Is it manipulative? Eh, maybe a bit. I think she believes in what she's doing, but boy, the music and the pictures are pretty manipulative. But do we touch hearts? Are we provoking an emotion? And I think one of the ways that we do that is by getting beyond just speaking with words that we incorporate a language that touches the heart. In my book, Beyond the Catechist Toolbox, I, I talk about how do we use space, sacred space to speak to those that are in our midst? How do we use music and song? How do we use silence, storytelling, movement and gesture? signs and symbols, ritual, doing works of mercy. How do we incorporate a language of mystery that touches the heart, not just a language of academics? There, there is an academic component to what we teach. There is knowledge that we need to have, but there is also mystery that goes beyond the words on the page of a textbook. So how do we do this within the context of encounter with mystery. So once again, that's from my book, Beyond the Catechist Toolbox. And there's a little QR code if you want to scan and have a direct link to that. Let me finish up and then I'll go to the chat and see the few last comments that people are putting up or questions. Number eight, are, are we inviting people to a new lifestyle? Um, not just a little add-on, okay? Jesus is not an add-on. He's not frosting on the cake. He's not sprinkling a few sprinkles on our ice cream. He has a new way of living, a new lifestyle. That's why we put on Christ and baptism. And in our catechesis, we may be teaching people who were baptized as children. Are we teaching them now how to put on Christ so that they think act and speak differently. Um, in my book, Practice Makes Catholic, I, I try to tackle that very notion that we have in Jesus a new way of thinking, a new way of speaking, a new way of acting. Are, are we providing people with new ways of thinking, new ways of speaking, new ways of acting? Are we giving them practices that really change the way they live so that, that people would look at them and go, what is it you're wearing? What's a scapular? Why are you wearing that? What, what is that? 
that they're evangelizing by the way they think, act, and speak to others. And then finally, are we creating customer evangelists? Uh, you go to any website that is um, promoting a product, you're going to find testimonies. I found this just randomly looking, uh, and they have a web page where they have testimonies of customers. Tim Carter is a customer for over nine years, and here's what Tim Carter says. Uh, all these people are what you call customer evangelists, and that's here's the book I told you about. It's a business book, folks. It's not a religion book. Don't go to Loyal or Press looking for it. You have to go to the business section. They are calling this evangelization, evangelists. You know, are we creating evangelists? Are we mentoring, apprenticing young people into a way of life that they will then in turn know how to go forth and proclaim and articulate their faith? That's what it all comes down to. And so in the end, um, we are called by, like St. Ignatius said, to go and set the world on fire. Uh, I've taken that phrase and made it my own, saying we need to go out and give the world heartburn. The kind of heartburn that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus had when they said, we're not our hearts burning within us. Uh, Mrs. Pye had heartburn. Oh, babe, the greatest gift you can ever imagine. My heart is burning right now. I've got heartburn. Let's look at the chat. It's time for us to wrap things up. So a few more things that people added in there. Um, okay, Teresa says, uh, for my fourth graders, I always have a printout of notes for my students to take home and discuss what we learned. And so when their parents ask, they don't have to respond, I don't know. Thank you. That is such a good thing to do. Can the kids go home and give a, a little charisma? to their parents? Can they go home and repeat a phrase that they learned, whether it's on a note page like you're sending home or whether it was something you taught them that night that they can go home and respond? Uh, Michelle says, I think talking about our own service commitment means so much. Yeah, I, I would re used to remind the kids I was teaching that I don't get paid as a catechist. I would say, you know, I'm a volunteer. You know, this is volunteer work, right? That I'm not getting paid. And a lot of times they'd be like, Really? <laughs> um, Michelle says, I think talking about our own service commitment means so much. Leslie, can we do that? Ronald McDonald House? Yeah, talk amongst yourselves. And, you know, certain things right now might not be possible because of COVID, uh, but there are ways that, that you can involve people in service, that even preparing meals that will be delivered perhaps to Ronald McDonald House. There are always ways. Uh, Sarah says, faith is lifelong. Uh, and that's a good note for us to end on. Um, I, I think, you know, and thank you for all the wonderful things that you shared uh, in, in, your, in the chat. I'm sorry if I missed anything. Once again, this is the book that I have been drawing from in this presentation, Preparing Hearts and Minds. Uh, there's the QR code if you want to scan and have direct access to uh, the book uh, and purchasing it, Nine Simple Ways for Catechists to Cultivate a Living Faith. Um, I also encourage you to take a look at a series that I have online, which is free, F-R-E-E, -E, free, Catechetical Formation Series, uh, 10 sessions that will help you to learn more about how to become uh, a well-formed catechist in three areas, our being, knowing, and doing. So there is the address as well as a QR code for this free online series of more catechist formation, like the kind of thing that I have just done with you this morning. And then finally, there once again is my, my blog, Catechist Journey. There is the Loyal Press website, and our 800 number, uh, which when you call on a weekday between the, uh, in the working hours, you will always get in touch with a real life human being. Um, and then finally, uh, your, 
educational consultant for Loyola Press for the Diocese of Joliet is Maureen Burisi. She wanted to be with us this morning, but then she found out it was her daughter's uh, mom's weekend at the university she's going to. And she said, I can't miss that. And I said, no, Maureen, you cannot miss mom's weekend. Those are things that we just have to do. So Maureen says hi. She sends her love and I'm sharing her um, information if you want to get in touch with her to talk about any resources that Loyola Press has that uh, can assist you in your ministry. And so I thank you for this uh, time uh, again. Uh, someone is asking, can I share the, the link for the podcast again? I think you mean the uh, series. Let me go backwards here. I'll put this back up. I think this is what you were hoping for. Um, I, I'm going to, to, to wrap things up then now. I just want to check with Joyce or Leslie. Is there anything that you need or want to say before we wish people well and send them on their way? Joe, I just want to thank you. Um, I know that some catechists were meeting in small groups with their uh, their DREs, so yeah. our numbers might not look as big as they really are. But I, I had that you. feeling that people were. You told me about that before, and, and yeah. so yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. This was very informative. And will you send us the link to this um, recording? I shall do. Um, okay. It's going to take a little while for it to upload on my uh, computer, but once uh, that's done, I'll send you the link and you can send it out to, to folks. But thank okay. you, Leslie. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. Joyce, yeah, you unmuted. Joyce. So, I just wanted yes. to, to echo the thank you um, uh, from the diocese. I know you could have done other things with your Saturday morning time. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, it was great. Thank you uh, for so many people joining us. It was a, a great uh, participation. And uh, thank you, Joyce and Leslie. Thank you to all you catechists. And God bless you. And let's go set the world on fire. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>